Good afternoon. Today we'll be discussing the book, The Art of Talking with Children, The Simple Keys to Nurturing Kindness, Creativity, and Confidence in Kids. Rebecca Rowland, who joins us today, is a Harvard Graduate School of Education lecturer, Harvard Medical School faculty member, speech pathologist, and mother. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that chat is disabled, but you can enter your questions into the Q&A feature, uh, which will be active throughout the event. And now I will hand off the virtual mic to Rebecca. Rebecca? Great. Thank you, Mayan. And thank you for everyone for being here. It's wonderful to see such interest in this topic. And today I'm going to be sharing a bit about my book, The Art of Talking with Children, as well as talk to you just about the journey that I had in creating this book and offer some takeaways for parents, educators, caregivers, and anyone who interacts with kids. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen now. Okay, uh, one moment. All right, so thank you. Um, this is The Art of Talking with Children, The Simple Keys to Nurturing Kindness, Creativity, and Confidence in Kids. So I hope this talk enhances your interactions with kids. This is really meant for anyone who engages with kids in any way. So if you raise, teach, nurture, research, or interact with kids. This is really a translational project. So meaning that it's designed to take what we know about conversations with kids from the research and translate it into something that's actionable, feasible, and fun for parents, educators, and caregivers. So in today's talk, I wanna give you a bit about the journey of this project, tell you some discoveries about the importance of what I'm calling rich talk, talk about some of the principles, and then give some takeaways. So a little bit about me, um, as Mayan said, I teach at the Harvard Ed School and also at Harvard Med School. I've also been at Boston Children's Hospital for over five years as an oral and written language specialist. And I worked um, studying at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. So I learned how to integrate oral language and written language. And I also have a master's in fiction from Lesley University. So I'm really interested in the creative power of language and literature as well. So I'd like to actually just launch a very brief poll to find out a bit about you. So I'd like to understand first, in which capacities do you most often interact with kids? So is it as a parent, grandparent, caregiver, researcher, and healthcare provider, a nanny, a teacher, or other, or maybe more of, more of you know, than one? And also, which age children do you primarily interact with? So if you don't mind going ahead, we're going to launch the poll now and go ahead and um, fill that out. And we'd just like to hear who is here today. So I'm not seeing, are you seeing the answers coming in? Yes, I am. Okay, so I'm, I'm not seeing the answers. Um, oh, which... uh, if you click on polls, I think you should be able to see it. Um, no, I can just see the questions, but I can't. Would you mind just summarizing? Uh, let me see if I make you a co-host, if that would make a difference. I see them now, thank you. Okay. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so I see the questions coming in. So it looks like um, over half are parents, grandparents, or primary caregivers. Then we also have a great number who are teachers or educators or more than one. So that's great. We really have a range of people and researchers as well. So it seems like a lot of us are doing more than one of these things. So wearing multiple hats. And that's really where I come from as well. So as a parent, but also a teacher and educator and someone who's done a lot of research in this field. And in terms of the ages, it looks like School age is sort of winning out in terms of elementary middle, but there's a lot of others as well. So babies and toddlers, preschool, and more than one. Um, so, which is really great because the, this book and this approach is really designed to go through the age ranges. So I argue that this type of framework can really work all the way from babies and toddlers through young adults and beyond. And it's wonderful to see how much interest there is not only from the parenting community, but from the educator community as well. So I'd like to just start with a very brief story which inspired this book. 
And this was with me um, and sitting with my daughter at the Museum of Fine Arts when she was about five. And I really like this story um, because it really showed to me how much kids can actually stretch their imaginations with a little bit of back and forth conversation. So we were sitting with the mummies and um, my daughter asked, where did the mummies go? And before they were born, where were they? And then she asked me, well, what about you? Where were you before you were born? And I said, oh, I don't know, that's a tough one. I don't remember, do you? And she said, no, what if you had to guess? And, um, and I asked her, what if you had to guess? And she said, I was an old man. I got sick of being so old, so I turned into a baby again. And I thought that was just so interesting to me and fascinating because we had never really talked about what happens before birth. Oh, there's some people um, with their hands raised. I'm not sure, should we, um, I don't know if, they have, if you have questions. Um, if you don't mind, I think we have the chat function, um, maybe to use that and then we can. Actually, uh, the chat is disabled for attendees, but they're welcome to use the Q&A feature. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. And I will try to answer oh, as many okay. questions as I can. Oh, okay. Can. So yeah, so more than one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some people are just noting that they had more than one kid in those age ranges. So we'll talk a bit about that as well, since this really does range through those ages. Um, so just going back to the story, uh, I found that was really interesting because I'm so fascinated by what kids can do and what they can come up with, with a little bit of back and forth. And I started to wonder, well, how would she come up with such an interesting answer? And I realized that this conversation really involved a lot of back and forth, but it also involved me as a parent saying, well, I don't know, what do you think? So it actually opened up that conversation for her and really allowed her to do some exploring on her own starting with something very concrete that she could see and that we could see together. So really thinking about joint attention in which we are both looking and talking at the same, about the same thing. And the fact that we really were sitting there with that time, with that sense of openness. And this prompted me to start analyzing, well, how can our conversations help children to stretch themselves? How can they go beyond a lot of the logistical and scheduling type conversations that we often have? So as I'm going to explain or explore in this talk, Talk With Kids is a really great opportunity to do a few things. First, to enhance your relationships in the moment. So I really think about it as providing more interest and engagement for the parents and for the child or for the educator as well. So you have more fun and enjoy each other's time more, but you're also building skills longer term. So I'd like to really talk about the power of back and forth talk. So this is what I'm going to be exploring, especially today. So I've seen this as a clinician, really, especially with children who have expressive language delays, as an educational assessor. So I teach educational assessment at Harvard, and we really think about understanding children holistically. So not just their test scores or numbers, but really understanding, well, how do they relate to each other? How do they actually relate to adults? How do they perceive themselves? And a lot of these things actually are things we can figure out and find out through talk. Also, as an academic learning specialist, I've really understood how much doing kind of formative assessment, not just assessment at the end of the year or you know, once every few months, but doing everyday assessment, check-ins, involves all of this back and forth talk. So you can actually understand how children are learning, how they're thinking, through this type of conversation. And of course, as a parent as well. I've realized that conversation affects nearly all aspects of children's lives. So we think about communication, but really this involves also their relationships, their success in sports and activities, their social skills, and much more how they perceive themselves and each other. So I really see it as a thread that weaves throughout children's lives. And that if we pay attention to in small moments, can really enhance their lives and our lives as well. So I really think about supporting children holistically and using talk as a window into a few questions. So things like, well, who is this child now? Not necessarily just, well, who are they, you know, as a two-year-old, who are they um, in this phase of their lives, but who are they in this moment? What are they actually interested in? What do they care about or what motivates them? And what are the processes by which they think or learn? 
And I think about having better understanding of these questions allows us to improve the support that we give to children, whether or not we're in the classroom, whether or not we're in, at home and so on. But it's really easy to misinterpret challenges with conversation. So I've heard so many of these, you know, in my circles professionally and personally, things like she's lazy, he's shut down, she never knows the answer, or she doesn't care about me or anyone. And sometimes these can be, have a grain of truth perhaps, but oftentimes they can be challenges with conversation. For example, a student who is having trouble generating ideas, is having trouble brainstorming, oftentimes may come across as lazy or oppositional. Or a child who seems shut down may actually have trouble expressing him or herself, or may have some kind of social and emotional challenges. So really getting beyond these labels, I think of conversation as a way to really expand on and explore what children are really thinking. So if we do focus on these labels, I really see kind of negative processes can happen. So a cycle of disconnection can start. Children feel less motivated, and then we end up developing negative perceptions and giving negative feedback. Um, and I, I would definitely, I'd love to take questions. I think I'm gonna go through a few slides now um, and then save a good chunk of time at the end for questions. Um, so if you don't mind just holding up your questions for now and we'll definitely get time for them. So I've also heard a lot in my clinical work that has been sort of heartbreaking just in terms of the misunderstandings and misconceptions about conversation. So things like, I shouldn't speak my native language with my children, they need English to succeed. So this misunderstanding about the fact that, you know, rich talk and many languages and you're using your native language is actually a positive. Or a lot of embarrassment or anxiety, especially around young children. So I don't know what to say to a baby, they don't talk back. Um, and just general, um, a lot of parents who feel ashamed of not knowing answers. So it feels like there's one right way to talk and I'm not getting it right. Um, or sometimes I've even heard parents who say, you know, my eight year old is asking me questions about crystals or about um, erosion and I don't really know what the answers are. So I feel embarrassed, I don't know what to say. So I'd really argue here that actually going on that journey along with a child of figuring out, of talking through what you don't know is much more powerful than just giving sort of a shutdown type answer. Because on the positive side, as I found back and forth conversation builds bonds in the moment and also builds skills over time. So we think about these interactions as really accumulating through the power of talk, through not just one parent and one child, but through educators, through other children, and all of these interactions as building potentially in a positive cycle. So I really saw the need for this translational book um, for a couple of reasons. So first I found as I read the parenting books as a new mother, that there was really an oversized focus on talk as discipline. So what are the magic words to say to have your child stop having a tantrum? Um, there was scripted and recipe based approaches. So I see a lot even on Instagram and things like that of say this, don't say that, you know, try these things, stop saying this. And I find that, you know, that can be well-intended and can be helpful at times, but it really doesn't attend to the nuances of the relationship that caregivers and parents and educators have with children. There's not much focus on child development. So I think it's so important that we understand, for example, how does empathy develop in a child? Or how does confidence develop? So that we're able to actually target our talk in a way that makes sense for that child's age and stage. And really that we're missing the power of talk to stretch and challenge a child. So I saw a lot of this more negative or behavior management oriented talk, but not as much of thinking of talk as a continuum. So all the ages, birth through young adulthood. So I also saw many unfounded assumptions. So things about, for example, kids should read books straight through with no interruptions. And that's really not research-based. So we know that dialogic reading in which children can interrupt can really improve reading. People saying, I know kids need to hear lots of words, so I talk at them as much as possible. And kids do need to hear lots of words, but they also need to hear the scaffolding in order for them to talk back. Things like kids either have empathy or they don't. Conversation doesn't help. Um, and actually, really, this, you know, this is sort of a misunderstanding that the fact that empathy can be built through conversation. And then things like the teachers told my bully child to talk it out with the bully. So the idea that conversation can fix everything. And we know now that, that bullying really does require 
oftentimes adult intervention and a whole school approach that does involve a lot of conversation, not just you go and talk it out. So I'd like to go to this essential question, which is what drove this book, which is really the question, well, which conversational frameworks and strategies can best enhance daily interactions between adults and children in a way that both deepens the relationship and that builds the skills children need to thrive? So kind of this relational question, but also a skill building question. My own research journey involved several elements. So first I was really focused on integrating research. So I looked at neuroscience, psychology, linguistics, and other domains. I also focused on extending what is known in the popular literature. So using what's known in the parenting world as a base and really going out from there and really thinking not just about young children or preschoolers, but all the way through the continuum. And then reflecting. So as I might have mentioned, this book is both a memoir and a guidebook. So I'm really using lots of stories from my own parenting life and from my own work as a clinician as well. So I used a few major theoretical frameworks. Um, you may recognize some of these. Um, first is goal orientation, which was the focus of my master's work, thinking about how we can help children see mastery as the goal. So actually understanding um, mistakes as part of the learning process, for example, and having children not feel as though they're competing against each other. Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, which is all about the scaffolding you can provide to children to help them stretch. Piaget's stage theory, so this was very critical just in thinking about how do we match our talk to children's ages and stages. And then self-determination theory. So I'm very interested in helping children feel empowered and autonomous and thinking about, well, how can our talk actually do these things? So obviously there's a long tradition of focusing on adult child talk. And I wanted to draw on these elements. I'm not going to go through them extensively, but I will just point to them that we do have Vygotsky, which is very, he's very focused in learning through the interaction. Montessori, so Maria Montessori, where I've worked at multiple Montessori schools, she's very much focused on child-driven talk. So the fact that work is a child's play. So, and the fact that we can really support children best when we're focusing on what they are interested in and what engages them. And then Piaget, who really focused on the type of questions you can ask to support discovery. So obviously there's also a great tradition at Hugsy of focusing on this type of work. So Catherine Snow, Meredith Rowe, Paolo Uccelli and colleagues do a lot of work in terms of both decontextualized talk, so talk that goes beyond the here and now, and even the work of uh, Meredith Rowe and gesturing. So thinking about how early gestures actually can support vocabulary development. There's also multiple Hugsy initiatives focusing on this work at a broader level. So things like making caring common, um, which is really focused on empathy. Um, the early education, Saul Zine's early education initiative focused on young children and then simple interactions focused on those everyday interactions. So I was very glad to see the rich tradition that we have here of thinking about talk and interactions all the way from young children through adolescents and adults. So as I <laughs> getting to my book, where I wanted to play a role was really to combine a few things. So I'm combining what we know from the research and using my own experience um, sort of as a way to feel humble as if I try these strategies and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I'm learning through doing as I go and having some takeaways that are actionable and also engaging. So the idea is that this should be engaging both to the caregiver, the educator, the parent, and to the children as well. So my key framing is that getting beyond one right way to talk. So I really wanted to upend this theory and to show that actually having a diversity of opinions, a diversity of dialects and ways of talking is very key. So I wanna recognize each family and classroom strengths rather than saying you're not talking right, <laughs> really understanding that talking in different ways is a positive for children and being culturally responsive is key. I also recognized, of course, that there are many barriers to deeper conversations and perhaps never more so than now. So busy schedules, children struggling to communicate, children who are having tantrums, family stress, and changes in children over time, especially with tech use. So as I interviewed parents for this book, caregivers and early educators, I really found that these were main themes that came out 
And sometimes it felt as if everyone was overstretched and they said, well, I can't add anything else to my life. So what can I do? So I found even more that I wanted to create strategies that were research-based, but really supported a reduction in stress rather than more stress. I also realized that habitual patterns can create challenges. So many times, especially parents who are working with young kids told me about using their smartphones sometimes as a way of getting some personal time, kind of avoiding the you know, constant stimulation. But we also find that as much as that is understandable, um, that this really does reduce oftentimes the interaction. So one study found that mothers' interactions with toddlers were reduced by a factor of four when mothers were using their smartphones as compared to free play without phones. There were fewer conversational turns, less immediate responses, and more ignoring of child bids to talk. So ironically, even though we might think we're getting a break by using the phone, um, sometimes this actually causes more irritation on the child's side, more bids to talk, and kind of can create a negative spiral. So then I moved to what is known as what I call in-person embodied talk. So the idea here is that you are sitting um, with a child and that you're all fully present. So the five senses are engaged. Uh, for example, Zoom only uses two of the five senses and we really can't be physically present with one another in the same way as we could in this in-person embodied way. The idea is that this really supports the social glue needed for bonding. It's easier to be responsive. You can notice the body language, the silences, children's facial expressions, and the ability to check in and repair. So even if there's one minor you know, comment, one facial expression, you say, oh, that seems like that made you upset. So you're able to notice and repair more quickly. I also thought a lot about conversation as co-regulation. So we often talk about self-regulation with children, the idea that children are able and are learning how to regulate their bodies, their emotions, and their minds. But really conversation in this back and forth way allows for co-regulation between the adult and the child. And the, the idea here is it's really warm and supportive interactions, allowing for the coaching and scaffolding children need both not only verbally for their conversations, but really to modulate their thoughts, their feelings and behaviors. So the idea is understanding that all emotions are welcome, for example, but how can we regulate them in a way that supports our functioning? So I think about the idea of what I'm calling great conversations, which is just the idea that they're engaging at two levels. So they're engaging at the level of ideas. They're exciting. There are new insights or emotions, they might be difficult. So we might be resolving or exploring a problem. We're trying to understand another's perspective. And this is really what's skill building as well. They're also engaging at the level of language. So it might be that you're expanding on vocabulary or syntax. You might be asking questions or evaluating thought processes. So this kind of dual engagement is what makes these conversations more potentially meaningful and more skill building than simple logistical ones. I looked a lot at neuroscience, which is showing so much more the importance of this conversational turn, which is the back and forth between adults and children. And Rachel Romeo and colleagues at MIT have done some really interesting work here. So back in 2018, they found that in a study of four to six year olds, only conversational turns predicted the variance in verbal scores and the sheer number of adult words didn't. Um, the number of turns was also linked to the amount of brain connectivity in language regions. So it's not to say that number of words doesn't matter. There's a ton of research showing that, yes, it is important to talk to your child, but at the same time that this is adding some nuance, showing that the conversational turns really do matter as well. And actually just recently in 2021, she did an intervention study showing that you can enhance these conversational turns. So actually this nine week study showed that um, the number of turns really could be enhanced and this linked to changes in language as well. I also drew from psychology the idea of conversation as connection. There's really great research on the importance of emotional reminiscing, which is just discussing the past in a way that's detailed, that's emotional, that's collaborative. So thinking with a child about something that happened and talking through how it went, how the child felt, um, and maybe what they did to cope. And really we found that children have actually stronger autobiographical memories when we do more of this and also that there's impacts on their social emotional well-being as well. 
And we think about why, it's because of a few things. We're supporting children to define who they are, to relate to others and to regulate themselves. So it's really doing multiple things. Also language scaffolding. So we know that it's important to talk more, to use longer sentences and sophisticated words, but even gesturing, so pointing to things also builds vocabulary, as does answering causal or why questions well. So if a child says why, and we just say, I don't know, or who knows, um, it doesn't do as much as actually going into it. So this is what I came up with um, as what I'm calling rich talk. I think about the ABCs of rich talk, which I made as a mnemonic to be <laughs> relatively easy to remember. The idea is that A stands for adaptive, which means that you're reflexible in responding to wants and needs. You're in the moment responding. So whether a child is in a bad or good mood, how their temperament is and so on. And you're also adapting over time. B stands for the back and forth. So you're really both working together to have a conversation and you're both engaged. And C is that child-driven element. So you're starting with what is on a child's mind. It might be positive or negative, what they're interested in, what worries them, but really you are starting primarily with what is on their mind. And I drew up actually seven pillars and each chapter goes into one of these pillars in which conversation can support the development of this skill and which I felt was very important for child development. So this is, uh, these are things like learning, empathy and social skills, but also confidence, play and creativity, being open to others and temperament. And one major um, emphasis of this book was really how do we reduce bias through talk? So not just bias around learning differences or racial and ethnic differences, but bias in all forms. And I really think of this book as hopefully supporting educators and parents to do that work with children of all ages. And I really see conversation as a gateway to skills. So these are just a few examples. So empathy can be supported, for example, through working on perspective taking, sharing emotions and so on. Confidence through practicing that mastery approach. So supporting children to learn through failure, to see failure as a positive. And learning through conversation that explores the big ideas. So one example I gave of the mastery approach is just that uh, my family and I started having what we call a mistake conversation every night at dinner. So we would all say, well, what mistake did you make today? Um, how did it, why did the mistake happen? And how do you think you could avoid the mistake next time or fix it? Um, and really this idea was meant to normalize mistake making. So rather than saying, oh, it's embarrassing or only kids make mistakes, realizing that we all are making mistakes all the time, they might be small or big and we can fix them and we can think about them for the next time. I also gave a framework of language strategy. So how does this rich talk work on a daily basis? And there are what I call the three E's. And these are research-based and actionable strategies that we can use with kids of all ages. So the idea is that they expand on a child's thinking, explore aspects beyond the here and now. So that idea of decontextualized or abstract language and evaluate the process and product of children's thinking. And the idea here is not to be a negative judge, but to really help children become self-aware about what they're thinking, about their goals and plans. And this really supports them in making predictions and helping them plan for their own lives. So what do the three E's sound like? These are just a couple of brief examples, but say a child says, for example, green truck, who's a young child. And you would say something like, this is a green truck. It's also dirty with funny wheels. So you're expanding and adding on to what that young child is saying. These are obviously just examples. Um, exploring, so how might we make the truck go upside down? How might we make it invisible? How might we hide it, right? So you're exploring these possibilities with and alongside the child. And then evaluating, for example, which part of the game did you like best? What might we do differently the next time? So here we're actually thinking together about actually how did that go? And this isn't negative, but this is really supporting the child through your own verbalization and your own questions to ask these kinds of questions themselves. And then I really do talk a lot about the issue of openness and bias. So these three E's can be applied to each of those pillars. And the example here is just for openness. So for openness, for example, expanding, you can expand on children's initial understanding, for example, of learning disabilities um, or learning differences. So if a child says, oh, I have dyslexia, that means I'm not smart. You know, you would want to expand, well, that's not actually true. So let's expand and explore why do you think that? 
Um, where does that information come from? And let's actually do some expanding of what we do know about dyslexia and learning differences. You explore, so you would explore how, for example, in this situation, how each child learns uniquely. So there is no sort of one right way to learn or one right way to understand information. There's really a spectrum of learning and we can actually benefit from different learning styles. And then evaluate. So how is the child perceiving each other in terms of their own learning and others learning? Is there a need for repair? Have there been hurt feelings and so on? So for rich talk, I really emphasize a few main principles, which is first to really attend to the balance of talk and silence. So it's not that talking more is better or talking less is better, but really attending to the fact of, well, we want to each be talking. So who's talking more than the other? Would I want to pull back and so on? Thinking about the level of questions and comments. And this is something we work on a lot in the speech pathology world. So how closed or open are your questions? And how abstract or concrete are they? And I actually have a next slide about that. And one aspect, as I noted, isn't better than the other. So I'm not saying stop asking closed-ended questions, but I'm really thinking, okay, we wanna just attend to it. And is a child responding better to one or the other? How could we shift? Really meeting a child at their level is the key. So I developed what I call the Rich Talk question map as a way of just looking at these questions and the type of questions we ask. So as you'll see on the X axis, it goes um, from the left, which is more concrete in the here and now. And then on the right is more abstract or decontextualized. So concrete meaning what's right in front of you, abstract sort of things that are not visible or not actually immediately happening. And on the Y axis um, up and down, the top is more open-ended and the bottom is more closed-ended. So as you'll see, each of these kind of creates a quadrant. And so there's four quadrants for each of these talks. And something that would be very sort of simple to answer would be on the lower left. So how many trucks do you see? So it's very concrete and it's also very closed-ended. You could say, you know, I see four. And that's actually not a bad question to ask at some level if you're working on counting with a young child. So I'm definitely not saying one question is bad and one is good. But at the same time, if we focus only on those questions, you miss the opportunity to do more of those open-ended and abstract ones. So really looking at, well, what does your talk, what do the questions look like? And how might they kind of shift, move back and forth according to the child? All the way up, um, if you go to the upper right, how do you feel about war? So that's something that's very abstract, very open-ended, and probably very hard for many children to answer just on an abstract level. At the same time, uh, my daughter and I were recently walking through the Boston Common and we saw lots of flags, you know, Ukrainian flags. And so we had a conversation about war, but it was based on something very concrete. So she asked me, what are these flags? And so we we're actually able to move from the lower love, which is really more that concrete right in front of you, all the way to something that's more abstract. So that's how I think about kind of using this map, not to say do this, don't do that, but really say, well, how can we move and shift flexibly in the types of questions we ask? And really, I'd like to sort of shift the framework in terms of learning from being a guide going along with the child rather than an oracle. So rather than saying we have to have all the answers, saying we're going to actually follow children along their path. So from director or teacher to a conversation partner, someone who might say and verbalize, you know, if a child says, uh, how many billion stars are there? Or how many stars are there? And you might want to say, well, they're billions. But you could also, you know, expand on your thinking. What do you know? What do you not know? Um, you know, is it, I think there might be 5 billion. I heard it once on TV, but maybe there's a lot more than that. So you're really starting to talk with a child about how you're thinking so they can understand not just the syntax and the complex language, but they can actually follow along and share with you that journey. And thinking about from one way to two way talk. So oftentimes I hear parents who say, well, I have a lot of speeches I wanna to prepare to teach my child. And sometimes it's really not necessarily about having speeches, but about really just having one question or one comment and allowing the back and forth to teach. So realizing that clinical questions um, or smaller questions can lead to larger ones. So this is just examples from my five-year-old recently. So who wants to know, why can't we float up into the sky? How can I get two balloons to stick together? And when am I going to be a baby again? Um, and this is really, I thought this was great because 
he really does think that he's going to be a baby again and he wants to know when it's going to happen. Um, and realizing that, you know, that's interesting to play with for sure, but it's also thinking about questions of aging, time and memory and so on. The same for worries. So questions like, why does she say she's my friend and then she doesn't wanna play with me? Don't doctors always give you shots? Or for older kids, if I fail this exam, does that mean I won't get into college? So really seeing these as smaller questions, you might say smaller questions, but they're questions that can lead to really deep discussions. And this is all to say that there is no one right thing to talk about or one right way to talk about it. Um, any type of conversation can lead to deeper questions, can lead to deeper understanding. It really is all about that back and forth. So I just have well, a couple more minutes. So I want to just emphasize the importance of play at all ages. So we oftentimes think about play as stopping in early childhood, but you can really play with language and through language at all ages. And talk is key, as I said, to reducing bias. So naming stereotypes to combat them recognizing difference in all of us and celebrating those differences. Also considering the level of vocabulary, length of sentences, the number of questions and a child's experience. So all of this is just really saying to meet a child at their level and then to see how you can help them stretch beyond that. Finally, just the importance of silence, gesture and touch. So, so many people have talked about the importance of being with their children or with kids in the classroom physically. You can notice extending wait time, for example, as a key way to really help children improve the quality of their responses. Noticing and celebrating children who might verbalize aloud and then those who process more silently. And recognizing, especially for parents and caregivers, the key role of touch and co-regulation. So just as takeaways, I'd like to emphasize that how much the daily back and forth conversation supports thriving in multiple domains. There really are implications for professional development as well as for parent support. So working on some of these assumptions and really thinking about taking those small moments and emphasizing that it doesn't have to be all at once or big topics, big conversations so that these small interactions do accumulate. And that enhancing these conversations benefits children and also benefits adults now and in the future. So before I stop, I just want to say thank you so much to my mentors at Hugsy and elsewhere, students and the children I worked with and met, and to all of the many researchers, educators, caregivers, and parents who have so graciously offered their time. So thank you so much. And I think, yes, we can probably take questions now. Thank you, Rebecca. We have some questions here. And feel free to enter um, more questions into the Q&A. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, all right, the first question is, I would love to know if you have any technique or approach to talk to children about grief. In your opinion, what do you consider important to implement during this pandemic for kids who have lost one or, or both parents? Yes, I think that's such a critical topic. Um, I think, as you may have seen in some of the research, um, they found that one in every four um, COVID deaths has meant the death of a primary parent or caregiver of a child in the U.S., um, so it's so critical of a time now. And I think that one thing that is so important to emphasize is that these things take time. So the fact that we need to be able to sit with children, we need to be able to not necessarily have lots of language prepared for them, but to support them in drawing them out and in ways that may be very slow and may be very gradual. So I often talk about things like using drawing, using movement as other mechanisms and ways into a conversation. So things that can be very simple and allow children who are struggling with a lot of emotions um, to support them in processing those emotions and drawing them out um, in ways that don't feel like as if they're forcing children to express themselves. Also to recognize that children have a range of styles in handling these things. And so it may be that some children want to talk a lot at first, and some children may really want to have more of a silent period to be with their emotions, um, maybe to be held and so on. So the fact that the nonverbal interaction is important as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, my five-year-old son just says, I don't know to these questions, which force him to think uh, creatively. Uh, how can I move beyond just asking questions and him saying, I don't know, do I need to give him some ideas? Yeah, so I, that's, a good, that's a great question. And I might just um, 
say, for example, that sometimes we think of questions of our questions as being very clear when to some kids, they aren't very clear. So one example I give is that we often say, well, how was your day at the end of a day um, you know, to kids? And we think about that as, well, that's a very clear question, but the obvious answer is, I don't know, um, or fine or whatever. Um, and so a lot of times we wanna think about how we are asking those questions in a way that starts with what is engaging to the child now. So one example I give is my five-year-old recently came home from school covered in orange paint. I don't know. Uh, and so I said to him, well, what happened? You know, and he immediately told me this entire story of how he was painting and a friend put orange paint on his shoulder or something. And so I think that when we start with what a child even is looking at or is playing with and wants to talk about, I think that you can often get beyond, I don't know, without sort of feeling like you're stressing or struggling to come up with questions. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, when I try to incorporate a learning or insight in our conversation, my child does shut off. According to her, she's right based on the one experience she had. How do I shape the insight I wanna pass on to her more softly or subtly such that it gets embedded? Yes, so sometimes we do, yeah, we can get into those back and forth with, I'm right, no, you're right, no, I'm right, that kind of thing. Um, and what I would emphasize is sometimes it may be easier to kind of pull back rather than to push more. And what I've found to be helpful sometimes is just to do some sort of thinking aloud with the child, not necessarily um, feeling as if you have to bring the child to your side. So sometimes we actually come in with a lot of emotions sometimes from our own childhood when we want to be right. And so it kind of becomes a tug of war, but I might just model for the child. You know, if the child says, well, it's that way because I've seen it, you know, I saw it once um, that, you know, you might say, oh, that's interesting. You know, I remember seeing this a different way a couple of times. And then you talk a little bit about that and just, just drop it, you know, and a lot of times a child will come back <laughs> in a few days or at some other point having reflected on it, but not to feel as if it has to be resolved in that moment. Great. Right. Uh, I have another great question here. Um, I was curious to know if you use social emotional learning, SCL techniques and programs, how do you implement social emotional learning practices during your interactions and work with children? If not, how do you feel about social emotional learning programs as they relate to the development and well-being of children? Yeah, so I think a lot about social emotional development of children. And what I really would like to emphasize is the fact that it can be integrated throughout the day, throughout literacy, throughout our conversation. So I don't really see it as needed as a sort of a separate box program or a box curriculum that we do as opposed to the rest of our day. I think it can be something that's interwoven throughout the day, even as an example, using a book that you're talking about. So this is a literacy building activity, for example, um, but you might easily explore, well, how was this character feeling when this happened? How might we feel? How might we support this character? You know, taking the perspective of other characters and so on. So rather than feeling as if this has to be something that's added onto our day, I would think about how it can be woven throughout your day, whether or not you're a parent or an educator. Thank you. Another great question here. I, uh, do you have any ideas for dealing with kids who are autistic or not very verbal? Yeah, so I work with several kids on the autism spectrum, some of whom are not verbal at all, and some of whom are sort of, you know, maybe more Asperger's, so they may be verbal but have very specific interests. Um, on the more nonverbal side, there are many picture communication systems. So you may have seen PECs or other systems, um, or can develop your own picture communication system. Um, where children are sort of pointing to things that they're interested in. I would emphasize, so I've done a lot of this work and I would emphasize not just focusing on basic needs. So we tend to really think first of, you know, food, bathroom, this kind of thing, but really kids oftentimes wanna talk about bubbles or plants or, you know, books or something like that. So really helping children expand through pictures what they're interested in talking about. Um, and kids who are more on the Asperger side of things with maybe more restricted interests, helping them use those interests as a gateway into talking with others. So not feeling as if um, you need to avoid those interests, but actually using them as a way to connect. Great, thank you. Uh, we have some time for a few more questions. Um, I have a child with language processing disorder, expressive and receptive. 
she's very resilient. She's very, sorry, she's very resistant to talking because she feels like I'm forcing her to talk. How do you develop this back and forth conversation more organically, especially with when your child has a language issue? Yes, that's a great point. And I think that sometimes one thing we don't always think about, especially with kids with language processing issues, is how quickly we often talk. And I know that I'm prone to this and a lot of people are, but we often ask many questions at once without noticing it. And we oftentimes talk very quickly. Um, and I've seen, for example, one example with a kid with language processing disorder, I saw the parents said to them, I want you to go brush your teeth, clean your room, finish your homework and come downstairs. And the child came downstairs and had just brushed their teeth. Uh, and the parent got very upset. <laughs> and so I think one thing to keep in mind is that um, actually clean your room to that child felt very abstract. So they weren't really sure. It sounds very obvious to us, but when you think from a child's perspective, it might mean, do I fold the sheets? Do I you know, open my books? What do I do? And so actually just making things more concrete for a child like that and asking one question and pausing um, can really be um, you know, a strategy that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. As an educator in a preschool classroom, children give constant verbal um, cues. I think this person meant cues for a conversation all the time during instruction time that don't always relate to content uh, topics. How do you address the child's um, serve to make them feel acknowledged, but also staying on topic? Yeah, so that, that is something that preschoolers are definitely working on, especially as they work on inhibition. Um, and one thing I've found just as an educator to be helpful is that you can either have kids write or if they're too young to be able to communicate easily in writing to have them draw um, something that reminds them of their question and put it in a box for you. So you can have sort of a question box or a question, you know, bucket, whatever you wanna have, um, put it in the center of the room have kids put their papers into the box as they think of their questions, and then you can open them at the end. So kids feel as though you are going to acknowledge their questions, but you can't um, help them you know, in the moment. Also, this is a, a moment to work on that social pragmatics or the social use of language. So you can help children recognize, well, let's think about your question. Is it on topic or is it more off topic? You know, and so if children, as they go, I think you can maybe help children start to recognize and become more self-aware of when they're asking a question that's one or the other. Great, thank you. Um, what do you do when a child uh, uses a lot of swear words or inappropriate language that they pick up at school from their classmates? <laughs> yes, so that's a good one. And I think that one is something that's very culturally and parent dependent. So some parents and educators and you know feel more comfortable with those. Some don't want any swear words in the home. So. I think it, whatever strategy would need to be very tailored to each specific family. Um, at the same time, I think that um, I would really talk more about questions of respect. So what does respect look like in our house? Um, you know, and what does it involve this? Does it not involve this? Um, and talking through kind of what do you want to feel as a community, as a family? And then how swear words, for example, aren't a part of that, if that's the case for you. Thank you. Um... I love the idea of mistake conversations, and I wonder how to make sure these conversations are positive and rich and being cautious of having negative conversations around mistakes. Definitely. Yeah. So I think it's really important. And I talk about that. I have a whole part of the chapter of, of that. Um, and I think that what's really important is the questions you ask, especially around mistakes. So not just what was your mistake, because I think it could get into sort of self-flagellation and being upset about it. Um, but what was your mistake? Why do you think it happened? So that chance of analysis, how did you try to work on it? So this recognizing that we are trying to fix our mistakes or how did you try to fix it? Did that work? And then what do you think you could try next time? How do you think you could either improve that? How do you think you could avoid that? So we're always thinking at the end of being self-compassionate, of understanding that we can always improve and that all of us are making these mistakes. You can also model as the adult making mistakes that may be minor, that may be kind of silly, um, and recognizing that all mistakes don't have to be chances to feel bad about things, but you can actually just say, oh, that was so silly. I pressed, 
you know, the up button in the elevator and I meant to go down. So I had to go up 14 flights and that was so crazy, you know, so you can do that kind of thing and it can feel much more playful than just always feeling bad about it. Maybe we encourage uh, young children to make that shift away from being so competitive. My four-year-old constantly wants everything to be a contest and he gets upset if he doesn't win. Yes, yes, I know that. I know that feeling in my own house. Um, and definitely, I think that one thing to keep in mind is how to reframe the conversation around cooperation. So let's see if we can help this person win. So you can actually try to shift and help children take the perspective. It's not always easy, but to really make conversations more about, well, let's see if we can all celebrate you winning this time. And then let's see if we can all help Emily win the next time, you know, and let's be glad that Emily won because we helped her, you know, and there's some games like that, like Hoot Owl, um, which can be good for kids because it is a cooperative game. So also bird games and things like that can help. Great, thank you. Uh, any suggestions on how to talk with children when they're angry, particularly teenagers? Yes, um, so I think sometimes in those conversations, similar to, I've talked a bit about tantrums and with young kids, sometimes we can talk things out um, with kids, but sometimes it's better not to use so much conversation in the heat of the moment in terms of the emotions. Um, and it depends on the teenager, obviously, but some teenagers will feel as if they're better able to have more of a reflective conversation when they're, you know, the emotion has passed. And so sometimes what I suggest doing is saying, to a child like that, you know, well, okay, go to your room or go to whatever you want to do. When you're ready, you know, slip a note under the door, open the door, just give me a signal and we can talk more then. So not to feel as if you have to push for a conversation then, because that can sometimes drive kids further apart. But to really say, you know, I understand if you need some space, if you need some time, that's totally fine. When you feel ready to talk, um, please just, you know, just come to me. Thank you. Um, what are your suggestions for speaking with refugee children who suddenly find themselves in an unfamiliar setting, a different culture, with a different language, in a foreign land? Uh, and this is based on recent events um, yes. where there is a lot of refugee children. Yes, and I, of, of course, it's a huge and important topic and definitely one too big for me to answer in a single brief summary. Um, but I would say that one thing to really keep in mind is that these children are facing a lot of trauma. So to draw from principles of trauma-informed conversation, um, of which there are many, um, and then also to really support and celebrate what they've come with. So really to help them recognize and celebrate their own traditions, their language, their history, and to emphasize that they're not supposed to just ignore all of that in coming to a new place, but we want to help them resettle through um, you know, having their roots also here. So emphasizing that as well, but it's certainly a huge topic and one we could talk about a lot more and should. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, we have probably enough time for a couple more questions. Um, do you have any examples of building in discussion times as a family? For example, dinner time or the other discussion suggestions for a busy uh, family? Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, I do find for some families, dinner time is a great time because you are sitting around. It's sort of known to be a time when some families that really works for them. Other families, I really think it doesn't work for them, you know, either because there's one parent who works late, kids are coming home from activities. So I really am hesitant to say, oh, this is the best time to talk because it really does depend on the family. Um, for other families, it might be at bedtime. If there is, you know, a time when the kids are more relaxed, when you're all sitting around, um, and so on. And for others, it's long drives in the car, actually. So I found that even some, some families say they're taking the metro. And this is actually a good time as well, because if you're on the subway and you can notice things that are around you to talk about, you can look at you know, what you've been reading and so on. Um, so I think it all depends on the family. Um, and some things I found fun, actually, which I just did on a whim, but I think it can be really helpful if you're interested, to, there are sort of like questionnaires you can start asking your children, just 10 questions, you know, what was your favorite X in the past year and so on. Um, and so if you feel like, oh, that's something that your kids would find fun, you can play these kind of games with them. Um, but really, it can also be more organic. So it doesn't need to be that kind of thing. But um, if kids can find that fun, it's kind of a jumpstart as well. 
Great. Um, one of our final question is going to be um, how to encourage shy children to talk. Yes, so that's a big one. And I think I would really encourage also to read the book Quiet by Susan Cain, um, because it really does emphasize the power of introverts as well. Um, and so recognizing that not all children are going to be, you know, on the extroverted side. So celebrating, you know, what a child who might be more introverted or shy brings. Also, just as a side note, introversion and shyness are not the same thing. So to realize that um, a child might be shy and introverted or not. Um, but in terms of encouraging them to talk, I would really start with where the child already feels comfortable. So if the child feels comfortable with a few friends, say, let's talk to maybe, let's try to stretch your comfort zone just a little bit. So could you talk to maybe a couple more friends or some kids find it really helpful to role play. So if they don't know anyone on the school bus, you know, who might you sit with? What might be the first thing we say? Here, you, I'll pretend to be this stranger. How can we go back and forth? So those are strategies that can kind of help a child stretch their comfort zones. But at the same time, I would really be hesitant to make that a negative thing because some kids really naturally are more talkative than others. Definitely. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this uh, wonderful conversation. And Great. thank you, everyone, for attending. Great. Thank you so much. And please do reach out to me if you have further questions. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.